Hello and welcome to the Idaho Reports podcast. I'm Logan Finney. The West Bonner School District in the northern part of the Panhandle isn't particularly large or unique in terms of Idaho school districts, but it's been rocked by controversy recently in several contentious board meetings since Brandon Durst, a former Democratic state lawmaker and Republican candidate for superintendent of public instruction, has been selected as the new superintendent. Joining me to discuss the issue and a recent recall effort filed against two members of the school board is Kevin Richard from Idaho Education News. Thanks for joining us, Kevin. Hi, Logan. Thanks for having me on board. So let's start this out with a conversation about Durst before we get on to that recall effort. Uh, Most folks in our audience here at Idaho Reports will be familiar with Brandon Durst and his political involvement, or maybe they remember him from the superintendent primary, but can you give us a refresher on him and his politics? The quick history on Brandon Durst is that he's been kind of a political chameleon and a bit of a political gadfly over the past uh, decade plus. He was first elected to the legislature in Boise, uh, representing Southeast Boise as a Democrat. Um, He served uh, a few terms in the legislature, both in the House and the Senate. He left, he moved to Washington State. Um, He ran for office, ran for the legislature in Washington State as a Democrat, uh, lost there, moved back to Idaho. And you mentioned 2022, and I think this is where Brandon Durst became more of a, a figure in state politics. He ran for state superintendent. He was part of that three-way Republican primary uh, for state superintendent. He actually finished second to uh, current superintendent, Debbie Crutchfield. He he defeated Sherry Ibarra in that primary and carried quite a few counties, especially up north. He, he won Bonner County, you know, the county we're talking about here. He won that handily. So he definitely, he appealed to hardline conservative voters in that primary, and he's continued to, you know, tack definitely towards the the hardline wing of the Republican Party, both as a Republican activist who's active in the Republican convention in 2022, very active in the education platform that was adopted, later took a job at the Idaho Freedom Foundation earlier in 2023. And in June, he was uh, hired as a superintendent in West Bonner. Sure. And as you've referenced, he had a, a brief stint as a lawmaker. He ran for superintendent. And so he he does have experience in the education policy realm, correct? I seem to recall he was one of the original bill sponsors for things like the Advanced Opportunities Program. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so his selection as superintendent back in early June has kind of been held up now because he doesn't quite qualify for the position of superintendent. Uh, can you Can you tell me about that? Because my understanding is he's met all the qualifications except for uh, four years actually working in a school. Right. There are several uh, criteria that are required to get a certificate as an administrator. You, you need, for example, you need a doctorate degree or a comparable education background. That's a box that uh, Durst appears to have checked off and says he's checked off. Um, administrative internship, uh, you know, definitely educational background, but you're right. The big sticking point, and he and Durst acknowledges that he does not meet this one criteria, is the four years of experience working in a school. So that leads to the need to then go to the State Board of Education and get an emergency provisional certificate so that he can can work as superintendent. And that right now is kind of in limbo. For reference, can you tell me how common the use of these emergency provisional certificates are? Is this a thing that's used widely across Idaho or more rarely? It's uncommon, but it's not that uncommon in West Bonner. Uh, You go back to earlier this year before Brandon Durst entered the picture in West Bonner, uh, superintendent resigned and uh, Susan Lucky was uh, named as the interim superintendent in West Bonner. Uh, Lucky had been a teacher up there, I think, for the better part of 20 years. Uh, She needed an emergency uh, provisional certificate to serve out the rest of that school year as interim superintendent. And Lucky was the other finalist for the uh, for the job in West Bonner and you know trustees selected Durst instead. And so now um based on some reporting from your colleague over at Idaho Education News Darren mm-hmm. Svon he's written that um the the school district hasn't actually submitted the application for Durst's provisional certificate because of some disagreements with how they handled Lucky's. Can you can you walk me through that briefly? Right. And this is where it gets really dense. And, and I do want to give Darren Svon credit. He's been our, our guy covering uh, West Bonner these past few weeks. He's, he's broken a lot of news up there. But yes, it, it, as he reported, it gets into a tiff between 
Wes Bonner and the State Board of Education over the way the State Board handled Susan Lucky's emergency certification. And you know, Wes Bonner is saying, you know, we're not going to we're not going to apply uh, until the State Board corrects the error on Lucky's provisional cert- certificate. So, yeah, again, this becomes a very complicated issue, and and, it be, and I think it kind of underscores some of the tension maybe you're seeing right now between. Durst and district officials, perhaps, and, and you know the state board and you know, you know state you know state education uh, policymakers in general. Sure, kind of the the pitch or the appeal that that Durst was making and the the board members who supported him were that he's a non conventional candidate that he they kind of hired him with the ex- expectation he would come and shake things up. Is that right? And pretty much that is consistent with Durst's uh, political MO. You go back to his run for superintendent last year. He was very clear that he was running you know, as as a change agent, as somebody who has political experience and you know would bring a political background into that aspect of the superintendent's job. Uh, you know, kind of leaned into the fact that his background was more in politics than in education. So what you're seeing going on right now between Wes Bonner and the state board, over this uh, certification, it, it seems very consistent with, uh, you know, with Durst's political MO over the past uh, several years. Okay, well, bringing it back locally to Bonner County up there in the north, um, it has not been a unanimous decision up there. There has been quite a bit of contention, several uh, school board meetings that involved shouting matches. I've read some kind of nasty letters to the editor in the Bonner County Daily Bee. Can, can you walk me through the the politics now that is surrounding uh, this appointment that um, from where I'm sitting, at least seems unusual for a school district superintendent job. It's unusual to see it at this level, but not unprecedented. I mean, you know, superintendent hires sometimes divide a a board of trustees and sometimes there's tension between trustees and a superintendent. We've seen that before. We've seen that in West Ada. We've seen it in Napa. It just happens. But I think it's happening right out of the gates now, just as uh, Durst is being hired, and I think it's, I think some of the tension in the community, as it's been directed at uh, two of the trustees, has been focused partly on some of the comments that they've made about uh, about the school district in general, especially Keith Rutledge's comments about teacher pay, uh, about uh, student performance, and the need to basically change the whole model of education in that district. Okay, and that gets us to Keith Rutledge and Susan Brown, who are the chair and vice chair of the West Bonner County School Board. Um, after Durst was selected for the job, residents of Western Bonner County in the over in the Priest River area, they began collecting signatures uh, for a recall campaign against those two trustees, uh, and that effort has qualified for the ballot. Can you talk to me about the significance of that move and um, how common it is for school board members to be recalled? It's not unprecedented for for uh, school trustees to be recalled. It's tough to successfully recall. I mean, we've had recall drives in West Ada. We've had recall drives in Middleton just in the past uh, couple of years. It's it's tough to get a recall on the ballot. It's even tougher to get it passed because basically the criteria it's a twofold. Uh, there are two criteria. You have to get a majority of voters to say yes, we want to recall this elected official. Then you have to pass the second threshold. The number of votes for recall have to exceed the number of votes that the office holder received in their last election. So it's not just enough to get 50% plus one. You've got to have 50% plus one out of a pretty significant voter turnout. So, yeah, it's not a done deal that these uh, recall elections are going to be successful. And these recall elections have taken on kind of a a partisan overtone. Uh, both Rutledge and Brown have received uh, donations from the Bonner County Republican Central Committee. You know, school board elections are, are becoming less and less uh, nonpartisan as we go. They're, they're definitely taking on more partisan overtones, and that's definitely the, the case in Bonner County. It it would be difficult, but not unprecedented, and not beyond the realm of possibility for these recalls to be successful. And just quickly, Logan, before we get off at this point, if these recall elections are are successful, why does that matter? It could potentially shift the balance of power on that school board, that five-member school board. Yeah, 
Durst was hired on a 3-2 vote of the Board of Trustees, and Rutledge and Brown were two of the three trustees who voted to hire him. If those two trustees are recalled and the remaining three trustees appoint successors, you could see that uh, that balance of power on the school board shift. Uh, that might uh, lead to a new board of trustees taking a second look at hiring Durst in the first place. We're getting ahead of ourselves here a little bit, but that's what's on... Yeah, but that's what's at stake. I mean, whether it involves Durst's uh, employment status up there or not, if these recall elections are successful, you'd see a you could see a real shift in the politics on that board really quickly. Sure, a few dominoes would have to fall before we got to that point, mm -hmm. but it is yeah. within the realm of possibility. But getting the two recall elections on the ballot is that first big domino that had to fall. Yeah, um, taking a brief personal privilege here, when I was a student at Sandpoint High School in the neighboring school district, um, there was an attempted recall campaign over one of the school board members who had suggested um, arming teachers in the schools, which, you know, now in 2023, that's kind of an old quaint political debate. But at the time, it was enough that a, a recall effort was started and, and due to some other factors, didn't make it onto the ballot. Yeah. And I think, you know, while it's a high hurdle to get a an elected official recalled, it is I think it's more doable at the local level. I mean, we are talking about a couple hundred votes here. It, it's not, it's not the monumental task. I mean, you hear once in a while people, you know, get upset about the governor, or they, you know, when Tom Luna was state superintendent, they'd be like, "Ah, oh, we should recall Tom Luna," and, and you'd have people say, "No, hold on, that is almost mathematically impossible to recall a state elected official." It's not as imp it's not impossible at the local level. It's just difficult. Sure. And so, of course, uh, Mr. Rutledge and Ms. Brown are arguing they should keep their seats. <laughs> um, can you tell me about the arguments for and against the recall that are being made up there now that sample ballots are being prepared? It's getting nasty. It's getting kind of personal. Um, you just look at the language on the recall ballots, the arguments for and against um, keeping Keith Rutledge on the state board and on the school board. We'll, we'll use his uh, his recall as an example. Uh, the one of the arguments for recalling Rutledge basically accuses him of having a hidden agenda. And if you read the the tone and you kind of read between the lines, um, people wanting to recall Rutledge are basically questioning whether he supports public education, period. Rutledge fires back and says, you know, it's really important to keep me in office. And, and by extension, he doesn't mention Brown, but it's pretty clear that he's uh, referring to her as well. It's really important to keep this conservative core on the school board. He's been saying all along that, you know, we need to show what happens when you have conservative leadership in a school board and in a school district and, and let patrons see what happens, what, what a difference that can make. So, yes, this is taken on a very personal and a very partisan and a very ideological tone. All right. Well, that, uh, like we said, the organizers did reach the signature threshold to uh, initiate a recall election that will happen in some of the precincts in Bonner County on August 29th. So about a month from now. Yeah. Um, Kevin, do you think is is this from your perspective, a extension of the pandemic politics that we saw on school boards throughout the last couple of years? Is this something new, more about conservative governance versus the old way of doing things? Is it a little bit of both? What's your read of the situation? I think it's a mix of a lot of different things, Logan. I think you're right. I, school board politics changed in Idaho and across the nation after the pandemic. You know, parents became a lot more upset about schools, they became a lot more upset about you know, in-person learning or lack losing in-person learning or districts that impose mask mandates. And that extended into concerns about indoctrination or you know, critical race theory or DEI or, you know, you know, insert your term that you want to use there. It became much more polarized. Uh, school board politics at the national level, we saw it, and Idaho was certainly not immune to that. So I think what you're seeing in West Bonner is an extension of that. I think West Bonner is illustrative of a lot of things that we've been seeing going on in rural education in a lot of different ways. The political nature of this school board and the and school board politics in West Bonner, that's certainly an example of what we're seeing on a larger plane. I think the financial issues that this district is facing are very sim symbolic of what we're seeing 
in a lot of school districts across the state. Back in May, back before Brandon Durst was even hired, or you know, his name was even floated as a, a candidate for superintendent, voters up there uh, rejected a supplemental levy. It was at the same time, the same election, that Coeur d'Alene passed a supplemental levy after a really heated local election, not too far away. Uh, they got a $25 million a year supplemental passed. West Bonners failed. And quickly, trustees were saying, look, we're going to have to cut extracurricular activities. We're going to have to cut sports. Now, you know, Brandon Durst has walked that back a little bit and said, I, I think we can find funding for some of these extracurricular and co-curricular activities. But that's what the district was talking about. That's what a lot of districts have to face if they can't get a supplemental levy passed. And that blows a 25, 30% hole in the budget in some districts. I mean, these are big elections. So what you're seeing, the financial straits facing West Bonner are certainly not unique. Any district that's had trouble passing a supplemental levy has had that similar kind of financial reckoning. And the reason we're talking about Brandon Durst, the reason we're talking about the superintendency in West Bonner, small district far away from Boise, is that a lot of these small districts just have trouble finding qualified applicants, whether it's for superintendent or for teaching positions. West Bonner had three applicants for the superintendent's position. Brandon Durst, Susan Lucky, who we mentioned, who needed an emergency certification to work in an interim capacity through June. They had a third applicant who actually, I think, I believe met the criteria to be a superintendent. Uh, that candidate uh, withdrew from consideration. So West Bonner was faced with two options, neither of whom uh, candidates who met the uh, the criteria to be a superintendent. And, you know, if you think it's just happening when districts have to fill a superintendent's position, you know, guess again, you have districts facing these same kind of questions over and over again when they have to fill teaching positions. I mean, it's, it's a tough situation in rural Idaho. You know, recruiting teachers, retaining teachers, making ends meet. All of what's happening in West Bonner is, you know, it's a canary in the coal mine. All right. Well, we will keep an eye on how that recall election turns out at the end of next month. And of course, you can read all of this great reporting over at idahoednews.org. Kevin Richard, thanks for your time this week. Thanks, Logan. Presentation of Idaho Reports on Idaho Public Television is made possible through the generous support of the Laura Moore Cunningham Foundation, committed to fulfilling the Moore and Bettis family legacy of building the great state of Idaho. By the Friends of Idaho Public Television and by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting. Hi, I'm Marcia Franklin, the producer and host of Dialogue. For more than 25 years, we've been bringing you conversations that matter. More than 150 of those conversations are with writers, and now you can take them with you wherever you go, while you're walking, around the house, or in the car. Just search for Dialogue with Marcia Franklin on Apple Podcasts and other podcast platforms, and remember to subscribe so that new shows download automatically. Enjoy.